it on. And I don't know if I want to put this on Facebook. I put the first one on Facebook and I'll let spirit guide me as to when I'll put them on Facebook. But I did put the first one out there on Facebook. So we have talked about spiritual man. And this evening, we're going to talk about manifest man. Let me just pray in first and say, blessed Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, pour your spirit on the pages of this book, pour your spirit on my mind, pour your spirit on my heart, and let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. I ask that you bless this gathering, bless this, this particular session, bless all that will be discussed tonight. And I I know you hear me. So I release this prayer in Jesus' name, and so it is. So um, anything, what did you guys think of the first lesson in spiritual man? What brought anything come to mind? It was a lot. Any what what is spiritual man? What is that when we talk about spiritual man? Let's Wasn't that when we last week when we were uh there was the four questions or so we kind of didn't get a chance to answer that question, I think. But uh I think you were referencing something from your PowerPoint to that because it was a lot and we didn't cover that, I don't think. Well, spiritual man is the spiritual part of yourself. Spiritual man is the image and likeness of God. And spiritual man is the, the I am in you and could also be called the Christ. Spiritual man is eternal and doesn't change. So I can look over my life and, and I can look at myself from a number of perspectives. I can look at my physical body. There are changes that have taken place over the years. Even going from a little girl to an adult, my physical body has changed. And even if I were to talk about my, my moral values, have changed over the years. There are some things that I may have thought was okay when I was 21 that I would by no means agree with today. So there's changes. And I could change in even personality changes. You know, people act like personality pretty much is, is formed by the age of seven and you're going to be well, the inner part of yourself may not have changed much, but there are things about your personality that even changes. And I guess I would say, you know, even your inner thoughts about yourself changes, depending on what you've been doing with your life and your spiritual journey. But spiritual man is the part of you that does not change. And so you're right, Betty, we didn't get into it to the degree that I wanted to, but and I did pull up some things, so I guess I should get right to it so we could deal with that. Um, yeah, let me deal with this PowerPoint. I don't have much of a PowerPoint. And I might even jump around on it depending on what we're talking about. But, okay, no, no, let me go back. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go to the part that I was talking about in regards to our threefold being and I didn't have this and I'm not sure if you got I'm I'm making it bigger you guys does that look bigger to you yes 
Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. So you guys seen this circle. Some people call it the circle, which would drive Reverend Teddy crazy because she says this is not, but it's your entire being. This is your entire being. It's your, you are threefold being. And when you talk about spiritual man, I don't know. Can you see my cursor? My hand? Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. The spiritual part. Now, we're not cut up in pieces and parts, but when the Universal Foundation for Better Living, as well as Unity, Unity has a slightly different format for this, but they decided that it would be a good idea to kind of divide this up in this way so that we could talk about it in an intelligent way. And it's a couple of ways you can look at your threefold being. And so the very top of this represents spiritual man. Now, in actuality, we're definitely not split up and every aspect of yourself is simultaneously operating. So your spiritual part of yourself is, is operating. You just are not always aware of it. But And you see right up there, it says spiritual man. There's a number of ways you can look at spiritual man. Paul says that you have a physical body, but Paul says you have a spiritual body. And when you talk about the spiritual body, you're talking about spiritual man. So you can talk about this by saying spirit, Christ, divine pattern. And, and, and I really want to focus on this concept of divine pattern a little bit later when we get to talking about what we've already covered. Image and likeness is the divine pattern. The divine pattern, the blueprint of humankind is the image and likeness of God. And that's why we say all that I am God is. Another word for spirit, spiritus, is breath. And so it is the very breath that moves in you. God is closer than hands and feet. It is closer than the next breath that I breathe. It is the I am. According to, to the Universal Foundation for Better Living, but when we go into feel more, feel more has a different perspective about that I am. But spiritual man is the perfect idea that God had of God's self pressed out into spiritual man with all of the attributes. Spiritual man is your DNA. It is your divinely nourished advantage over anything. That is spiritual man. But we operate in our soul. And another word for soul is the entire mind. And that's right here. And I'm going to tell you, there are a zillion, a zillion different forms of new age, new thought, new different ways that people are trying to understand the law of attraction and they go to this conscious, subconscious, superconscious. I just read it in this book that I got. Wait a minute. That I've been working with this book. And it is the key to the universe evolved consciousness. The scripture addition is the project 369. And this is not necessarily new thought. And it talks about conscious, subconscious, and superconscious. 
And so that is your soul. How am I thinking? How am I reasoning things out? What am I worrying about? That is your conscious mind. What decisions am I making? What am I willing myself to do? What am I rejecting? These things that you are aware that you're doing, the choices that you are knowing that you're making is in your conscious mind. And that is your thinking nature. But one of the things that I'm really coming into the awareness because I've been focusing so much on the law of attraction right now and manifestations. And one of the things that I'm really, really coming into the awareness is that it is really the engine that causes these processes to move is in the feeling nature. And your feelings have to do with so much. And that subconscious mind is so deep. It's what you don't even, you're not even aware of. You're not aware of the fact that the memory that you have of being rejected when they didn't choose you for baseball as a kid could have an effect on you today. Even though you knew this happened, but you like that happened so long ago, it couldn't possibly have an effect on me. And then you feel rejected as an adult and you're triggered because you felt just like you felt when they didn't pick you for the football team or kickball or whatever. I can talk about that because I am not athletic. I would have, I wasn't the last kid, but I would have been among them. <laughs> and so that seems like a trivial thing, but it may not be. May not be. So your memories is in your feeling nature, your experiences your opinions and your beliefs about this world and about people color your feeling nature. So you have believed and was grown, grow, you grew up believing that purple people are the devil. They just terrible. And then you go into this new way of thinking and say namaskar and I behold the divine in you. But you could say that to doomsday and it won't be true for you if deep in your subconscious mind you have an issue with short people, tall people, white people, brown people. And that's going to color your experiences. Because what you feel is to be true is going to be somebody that's going to agree with that. If you believe that people are basically rude, selfish, or if you believe that people won't respect you or like you, the universe is going to produce experiences to agree with that. And you will meet people that confirm what your belief is. It is through our thinking that we shape and form our world. And then you have this Christ mind, super consciousness. And the thing about the spiritual man is man, spiritual man is pouring divine ideas through super consciousness. And the more you stay in alignment with that part of yourself, the spiritual part of yourself, the more receptive you are to the divine ideas. So even because, you know, you may think that 
it'll say, well, I need to be still. I need to get quiet. I need to go into meditation. And yes, you do need to do that, but we can't spend all the time in there. But your work in the silence is like money in the bank. So even when you're not doing that because you are constantly keeping yourself in alignment, you get inspirations and you can hear it easier because your predominant mindset is to be in alignment. And that's why you experience some beautiful things because you've been working on yourself so much and you've been praying and you've been meditating and you've been affirming and you know, so you're always in alignment and just like those beliefs can color your experiences, truly being in alignment with the truth of your being as a spiritual entity created in God's image and likeness is coloring your experiences. And so you experience healings and overcomings and you experience synchronicities where it seems like the whole universe is conspiring to assist you. And so you say with the psalmist, yea, though I'm walking through some stuff right now, I don't have to fear nothing because God is with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. And you're preparing this table before me in the midst of all this stuff. And you're anointing my head with oil of love. And my cup is overflowing with goodness. So I know goodness is mercy is following me all the days of my life. And I'm dwelling in your house. That's an energy and a vibration that you're walking in when you're keeping yourself in alignment. And so divine ideas are always flowing in the super consciousness. But if you are never stealing yourself to hear them, it's harder for them to get through. Any questions? So what is spiritual man? It's the truth of your being. Thanks, Betty. It's the truth of your being. And your body is the vehicle from which your spirit and soul is expressing. The physical body and your affairs, your life world and affairs as well. This is the vehicle through which your soul and your spirit is expressing. Spiritual man is the focal point of the divine intelligence of the universe. It is one with God. We talk about how last week we said that there is only one mind and we all share consciousness in the one mind. Spiritual man is aware of this. And because of this awareness, all the intelligence, all the abundance, all the prosperity of the universe is available through spiritual man. That's the focal point to everything in the universe. And so you can get your solutions there. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's mind blowing. I'll move on off of this. Let me put it back. It wants me to put it back. Oh, let me see. Let me stop this share for a minute because it's doing something weird. Any questions so far? That's what I wanted to bring up last week, but I couldn't. It's a couple of more things, but we'll get to it. If you were to change your, your subconscious thoughts in your current day based off to to modify things that has taken place for your thoughts for when you were no you can't change your subconscious thoughts right no it's your conscious thoughts well and, here yeah. is what happens and let me go back to this thing here here is what really happens with that um i'm gonna go to the presentation what happens is this 
are you gonna let me do this? When you are consciously using affirmations, I got I don't have my book of full of affirmations. I got so many of them. When you're consciously using affirmations, you grew up poor and you saw lack and limitation all around you in your entire neighborhood. But you have decided that you believe in the abundance of God. And so you begin to affirm that I am a magnet for abundance and the wealth of, no, uh, for wealth and the abundance of the universe. And you start to say that self to yourself. You made a choice. I'm a money magnet. I'm worthy of large sums of money. Money comes to me in expected and unexpected ways. Good things are always happening to me. When you start to speak like that, you may not believe it at first. And it may not even feel right. But the more and more you study, you are speaking in that language of spirit. When I say that the Lord is my shepherd, I don't want, my super conscious mind says, yes. You are so right. Say more. And you keep saying that. And like I said, divine ideas are always pouring into super consciousness. And you, your conscious becomes in agreement with the super conscious. There is a thing that's called the Holy Spirit. It begins to stir because of that. See, it begins to stir. The Holy Spirit is the activity of God. And it pours into your subconscious mind. And you begin to purify. So yes, your subconscious mind can be changed because it's like you got this, this, this jar with dirt in it and you keep pouring that fresh water. So some of that residue begins to dilute and eventually the glass is clear. So the subconscious mind begins to release some of those thoughts of doubt some of those ideas of low self-esteem, some of those fears. It's, in scripture, it said you become new creations in Christ Jesus. And so you are not necessarily changing the subconscious mind. It is happening by way of the Holy Spirit because of the work that you do. The activity of God begins to pour in you to such a degree that you are changed. The, the, the religious songs that people write is so on point. My girl Tremaine Hawkins says, you washed away all my sins and you made me whole. I've changed. A wonderful change has come over me. You changed my life complete. And so all of those words is really what people do experience. You are changed. The only thing that doesn't change is the divine in you. But anything that is not divine can be changed. My beliefs of lack, limitation, or fear, or whatever it is I got in my subconscious mind that is out of alignment can be changed. That's called healing. That's not necessarily the physical healing, but it can lead to the physical healing. That's healing. 
So yes, it it can change, but it's it's not an overnight thing. And it is a process. Now I hear people say it's a work. I don't like that. I don't like that. And the reason why I don't like that is because that just makes it sound too hard. But it is a process. And there's a friend of mine that says we got to trust the process. There is a process. It's a journey. It's a commitment. But it can be joyous. So I won't call it a work. Because when people say that, they make it sound so hard. So I don't want to do that. Because that's the energy that you're putting on the process. You know, I'm not going to put that energy on that process. Because your journey as you are growing can be a beautiful journey. And it can be beautiful no matter where you are in life. I was a single mother on welfare. And some of my most beautiful epiphanies occurred during that time. The realization of the oneness of everything occurred during that time. Jehovah Jireh providing for me occurred one day when I walked in the house and the lights were off. Jehovah Jireh occurred one time when I didn't think I had what I needed for my son's Christmas. And these things were provided for instantly. Instantly. And so the concept that my needs are always being provided for, that the universe got my back, occurred when I wasn't making money. So it has nothing to do with whether you have the manifestation in the physical or not. So we shape and form our world. Let me, I'm moving off topic. Any, any, any um, comments? Reverend James, are you with me? He said, yes, he is, but he's muted. Okay, well, you can jump. Am. Okay, you can jump in. You got anything to say? No. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go back to this, this PowerPoint and hope that I can make it act right because it don't want to move now. Okay. I don't know what I did to this PowerPoint that it don't want to move. But I promise you, I will not use the, the slideshow and I'll just use this. Okay. We'll just use this because it's acting funny. So just a reminder before we get too far, but I did want to talk about um, that threefold being and we'll go into the thinking process. But just a few terms, because in um, the first book of, of, of Genesis, we, we meet Elohim, God. And, you know, this is a concept that's found in the mystical Kabbalah and other, I mean, in the beginning, it was just God. It was, it was God. It's this thing that we can't, not even a thing, this, this energy that we can't explain. The original mind in creative action. El means the strong and ever sustaining one. And Allah to swear or formulate by the power of the word. Elohim thus represents the universal principle of being that designed all creation. And I was taught in my, I'm such a good new thought student. I re always reflect back to the basic principles. I was taught in my, my basic truth class that 
Elohim is God operating in the ideating capacity. And that's just talking about generating ideas, perfect ideas. Now, we're going to be talking about manifest man, Jehovah, who he who is, who was, who will be manifest, the self-existent one. Um, I don't know what that says. He who is eternal in I am that I am. The absolute verb remains the same, but the prefix changes from manifestation to power. He to I. The word forward rendering the original word I am, I was, I will be because I am, I was, I will be the power to be eternally. Jehovah is the Christ in Old Testament. Jehovah has also been considered I am, which is also our spiritual identity. Jehovah is who Moses spoke to. And he said, well, who am I going to say sent me? And he said, tell him I am that I am sent you. I am is my name forever and ever. And that's how we identify ourselves. So we just wanted to cover those two terms before we move forth. And when we talk about Elohim, we are talking about God as universal mind. Universal mind refers to God as the source of all knowing. There is only one mind. We all share consciousness in the one mind. All ideas come from God. All ideas come from God. So if all ideas come from God, why is some of these funky thoughts floating around? Any, anybody want to tackle that? If all ideas come from God, why do we have these funky thoughts? The idea may begin with God spiritually, but it's filtered through us. And we can take it and we can shape it and come up with our own individual thoughts. So if the idea comes from God, it starts as a divine idea. But once it goes to the mind of man, uh, you know, you don't know what may come out the other end. Yes. Exactly. The individual then functions according to his or her level of understanding. Thoughts are a product, are a product of our, your thinking. The individual then functions according to his or, own, his or her own understanding. And to just capitalize off of what Reverend James said just then, we can review this. It is said that the universe is teeming with all these the beautiful divine ideas that are perfect, but he said they filter through your consciousness. It's the little stick man you guys probably have seen. Filters through your consciousness and what's in your consciousness. What well, you're being, you're being uh, influenced by your traditions, your culture, your peers, your past experiences, your environment, all the stuff in your subconscious mind, it's got to filter through. And so I like to say that Janice has this idea about prosperity because she gets this idea of the abundance of God comes through her mind and she gets this idea about prosperity and she may go out and start a business or something. But a kid that's, that's come up in the bricks of Cleveland, the projects of Cleveland or Chicago or Detroit, wherever, that has seen nothing but lack and limitation, gets an idea that he should be prospered. And he goes about robbing people because the idea of abundance filters through his consciousness in an erroneous way. And so we shape and form our worlds through this. Divine mind is teeming with divine ideas. 
Ideas are expressed through the understanding of the thinker. Divine ideas are filtered through the mind of the thinker and the person's belief system. You have the power to choose how you receive the ideas of spirit. Because divine ideas must be interpreted. Divine ideas must be interpreted. And I'm going to tell you something. We're interpreting stuff all the time. So let me get, I'm going to move past all this. But let's get, because in the reason why I went through all of these things, and these things are basic truth principles. But the reason why I went through them is because what we're talking about in the first book of Genesis, we said was the creation process, the creative process, and that we create in that same way. Let me go to the first slide, though. I did miss one, so let me do that, and then I'll let it go. One that I think I needed to, to just read through, and then we're going to go to the book. Right here. This is the thing. The key to the operation of mind is symbolically set forth in the Genesis account of the six days of creation. Man's mind goes through the identical steps in bringing the ideas into manifestation. Between the perception of an idea and its manifestation, there are Six definite positive movements, which we discussed last week, followed for the seventh with the seventh day of rest, in which the mind relaxes and sees its work in a process of fulfillment. And when I read that, and I know we're talking about the Sabbath in the second chapter, this is the question that I want to give to us to think about. You get a divine idea about whatever it is. It could be a healing. It could be an overcoming. It can be a, a healing in a relationship. It could be a business. It could be some kind of project. The thing that you're working on, it doesn't matter. It's the same process. So what is the Sabbath to you? And how do we keep it holy? Because the book, of Genesis talks about the seventh day of rest. And we have been told that we need to have this Sabbath and keep it holy. Anybody want to tackle that? What is the Sabbath? And, and I'm going to go to 31 in the book. And how do we keep it holy? Holy. All right. I know this is probably far off, but um, the Sabbath to me is when I've been given a task and whether I get to the um, end of that task or during the uh, whole process of it, sometimes, you know, in order to see the vision a little bit clearer, you got to just step back and take a minute and just... Um, breathe and just meditate that's how I would keep it um, uh, keep it spiritual or whatever but uh, just before I can before I'd have to move forward I just need to take some time and just rest mm -hmm. and just listen to what the next process of things might be mm -hmm. um, coming from um, from God just listening to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, to me, to me, it would just be a day that uh, set aside just to just to honor God and and the creation uh, process. To me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is rest. Mm -hmm. It's rest mm -hmm. in whatever way, and it's not. It can be a day, but it doesn't have to be. 
I told my husband, I said, I don't even have a day of Sabbath, but I might have 15 minutes here and there. <laughs> but it is a resting period. Let me see what Fillmore says. So I'm going to move ahead, move above first. And, and we're going to get to this Sabbath. I'm not going to go right to it. I'm going to go first with Manifest Man. It says, the book of Genesis gives us two accounts of the creation of man. The first, that of the creation by Elohim, and the second, that of the creation of Jehovah. A right understanding of the processes of mind, the mind uses in bringing forth its children, its ideas. A right understanding that your mind uses to bring forth its ideas, which Fillmore is calling children, enables us to perfect harmony between these apparent conflicting accounts. Be and the reason why Fillmore is saying that there is a conflicting account here. Now, keep in mind that what we're talking about here in the book of, of Genesis represent aspects of your own spiritual unfoldment. And this is going to be true in all of the books. The first book of Genesis is talking about the perfect blueprint that God had for all creation. And from the point of view of Fillmore, nothing has been created in the physical when you're talking about Elohim in that creation process. These are all ideas. They're ideas of what this world should be like. Now, the perfect idea of this outline in the first book of Genesis did not include some kind of large fire putting all this crap in the air. So that's not what was created by God. That is not the idea that was created by Elohim. When Elohim declared everything was good and very good. After the whole blueprint was created and humankind was created in God's image and likeness, Elohim rested. And what Fillmore is saying is this represents how we are creating. So divine mind within you, that Christ mind within you may have a, a, a perfect idea about how you should be expressing. And it's complete. That's why you have people like Abraham Hicks or Esther Hicks that would say it's in the vortex already. Perfect. Waiting for you to step in it. So this divine idea of whatever it is you're supposed to be expressing is completed in the invisible realm. But yet we haven't stepped into it. When we're talking about the creation process, that perfect idea that you put down on paper about your business, that perfect business plan with the perfect vision and mission is a blueprint. But then when you go about actually bringing it forth in the physical, it may or may not look like that. Because as Reverend James said, this divine idea has to filter through everything in your consciousness, which colors it. So Jehovah God formed man out of the radiant substance. And so Jehovah God forms. However, Elohim ideates and creates. 
any questions because this is Phil Morian philosophy. This is how he went about seeing it. And you're going to take some of it and some of it you won't. Because that's how I do <laughs> with Fillmore sometimes. I definitely take issue with Fillmore sometimes. But this is what he is saying. He's saying that that part of God that forms is Jehovah. And that is what formed all of the things that manifested. And it was formed out of the substance of God, which is still invisible, really. So we're talking here about manifest man. The unfolding man is God's man or the divine idea man in process of construction. The unfolding man is the God's idea that is being constructed in the physical. We are unfolding. My song Change says, I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be because I am unfolding. I am unfolding. Manifest man is the man we see, the man we behold with our senses. Manifest man evolves or makes manifest the ideas as he receives it, as they filter through his consciousness. So it says here that you should know that your temples of the living God. Eventually the manifest man, the ideal man will merge into one. Eventually your higher self and your manifest self, what you're manifesting in the outer is meant to merge into one. And so we meditate to have that experience with the higher mind. We, we go into meditation to experience altered states of consciousness, higher states of consciousness that puts us in oneness with our own higher mind. Why do you think we want to do that? Why do we want to experience the higher mind, the Christ consciousness? Why? Could it be that we want to do that because that higher mind is one with God? And it's the focal point of all the abundance in the universe and all the intelligence in the universe and any answer to any prayer. It's right there in your own higher consciousness. Because you are temples of the living God. So it says here. That and the heavens and the earth, I'm reading Genesis 1, 2, 3, were finished in all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he made. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because in it, he rested from all the work which God had created and made. And Elohim finished, did never because all the ideas of perfection were already done. He finished. So to hallow the seventh day, as both Ibedia and Janice said, is to rest in the stillness, quiet, the peace of the silence of mind. Be still and know that I am God. The, to hallow means to keep holy. Holiness is resting in the conviction that there is no lack in the absolute law that is the law of God. One creates first in mind by idolizing the desired object and then resting in the assurance that the law of manifestation is being fulfilled. And so the problem that I have sometimes is I won't rest. I get this beautiful idea. I want it so bad and I try to make it manifest by my might. 
I don't know if I'm the only person that's done that. But it says here, what I'm supposed to do is to rest in the insurance that the law of manifestation is being fulfilled. Our Sunday is a symbol of the true Sabbath. A time when men turn away from business and the pleasures of the senses to seek a day of quiet and holy rest. The great Sabbath, the rest of God, is for all who will enter it. It is a state of mind in which we rest from outer work, cease daily occupation, and give ourselves up to the meditation or the study of spiritual things. The Sabbath also symbolizes an attitude of mind in which we relax the outer consciousness. Sometimes you got to let go. Have you ever tried to make something happen over and over again in the minute when you quit carrying it manifest? When you just said, well, I'm just going to let that go. I tell you, my first promotion I remember this just as clear as day. I had tried to get promotion after promotion and kept denied, denied, denied. And then the, I had temporary positions that had been given to me, but they were all temporary. Sometimes it's just hard to rest. Seems like there's always so much to be done until your force. Is it more? Let me see. Until you're forced to, yes. And you don't want to be forced to. But I tried and tried and tried. And I think um, I had an experience where I just knew I had some. It didn't materialize. Now, I end up in a situation I really didn't want to be in with a supervisor I really didn't want to be with. And I ended up taking a job working in um, Grafton Correctional Facility as a parole board parole officer. My boss was in Columbus. I never saw her. I had an office. Nobody ever bothered me. And I remember walking down the hallway. I see it as clear. I see myself walking down the hallway and saying, I could just do this. I can just do this. And I meant that with every core of my being. And that's when I got my first promotion. I just rest. I gave it. I'd done everything I could do. The singer says, once you've done everything that you can, stand. I just rested. <laughs> so it's something in the resting period now here 2, 4, 8 it gets really interesting there says, it says these are the generations of the heaven and earth when they were created in the day that Jehovah God made earth and heaven now we've already dealt with Elohim now, in the second book of Genesis, it says, Jehovah God, and no plant. Now, this I want you guys to think about. Think about the first book of Genesis and what you have gone through. Everything was created. The plants, the birds, the, 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 the uh, fish, and man was created. In the second book of Genesis, after it says all that in the first book of Genesis, it says, and no plant of the field was yet on the earth. And no herb on, of the field had yet sprung up. For Jehovah God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was no man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And Jehovah God formed man of the dust in the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And Jehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, 
and there he put the man whom he had formed. So in the first account of the creation story, God creates first the heavens and the earth, and then man is the last thing this plant is created. All the plants and the birds and, and animals and creepy things, all these things have been created. But in the second book of Genesis, it says man hadn't been created and there was no herb in the ground because there was no man to till the ground and God hadn't caused it to rain. So now we're talking about manifesting. The divine idea was created in the infinite, in the eternity but it was not necessarily physically created according to Filmorian philosophy. But it makes sense because when you go to the second book of Genesis, it's like, wait a minute. In the first account, everything is created before man, but in the second account, man is created and then the plants. And probably it didn't, doesn't mention when the animals are created. But after man is created, God brings every animal to him for him to name it. And so we have naming power. Jehovah, I am in Hebrew, is written Yahweh. Yah is the masculine and Way is the feminine. Now, go back to your first book of Genesis. If you go to the King James Version, all the other versions have cleaned it up. But you go to the King James Version, it used to be like this. I don't know if it still is now because sometimes I think they just change the Bible little by little as they go. They keep making new and newer and newer interpretations. But if you go to the King James Version, it tripped me out when I was a little girl. When I read, Man was created in God's image and likeness. Male and female created he them and blessed them and named them Adam. And named them Adam. So the male and the female aspects are present. I'm not saying that Adam was a morphodite. I'm not going into that. I'm just saying that both male and female is a part of this divine man. Both aspects. And is that here representative of something uh, metaphysically, metaphysically, the name Adam. Um, Adam, if we want to look it up. Let's see. Okay. So Adam is the first movement if of mind in his contact with life and sus substance. So you know Fillmore is out there. Adam also represents the generic man or the whole human race epitomized in an individual man idea. Eve is the feminine aspect of generic man. Outwardly manifested, male and female created he them. If the ego or will which is man had altered his uh, had altered to wisdom faithfully and has created out of its work the plans that are idealized in wisdom. It has created harmonious consciousness. Adam in the Garden of Eden is symbolic of that consciousness. So Adam is the original creation in his original creation was in spiritual illumination. Spirit breathed unto him continually the necessary inspiration and knowledge to give him superior understanding. But he began eating or appropriating ideas of two powers, 
God and not God, good and evil. The result, so the allegory relates, was that he fell away from spiritual life and all that it involves. So Adam is really an idea and it contains Eve as well. Remembering that Eve was made from a rib, but Eve was more than a rib. It was all in the divine idea of man. So we have to remember that these stories are best understood when you realize that it's allegory. If you want to think about Adam as an actual person, then it gets all messed up. Because the truth of the matter is, old, new, old King James Version says, male and female created he them and he blessed them and named them Adam. Which is an indication of something that was happening with the Hebrew faith there. It means something that we in our Western mind don't even understand because I don't think it has anything to do with Adam being a homothodite, although there are teachers that believe that. Because I believe um, if you've ever taken classes with Dr. Will Coleman, he believes that. And that's what he teaches. So Jehovah, I am in the Hebrew is written Yahweh. Yah is the masculine and way the feminine. The word is made up of masculine fem feminine uh, elements and represents the joining together of wisdom and love as a procreating nucleus. Wisdom and love is what's in the word Yahweh. Wisdom and love. And if you study other wisdom teachings, they talk about the ray of wisdom and love. Or you might even see it mentioned in the mystical Kabbalah. Some of the things that we've done in our spiritual awakening group totally agrees with what Fillmore is saying here. When he says it's wisdom and love. This is the Jehovah God who made the vis visible man, the man of self-consciousness. God manifests in substance is the Jesus Christ man. Elohim, universal mind creates, but Jehovah God forms. Being is without beginning or end. Being with a capital B is without beginning or end. And so, Father, I want to see the glory that I had with you before the world was formed, Jesus said. Because I am Alpha and Omega, it's no beginning or end to spirit. Just like you don't have an expiration stamped on your feet, date stamped on your feet, you also don't have a beginning. <laughs> Whew. So there's a lot going on in the book of Genesis and especially in this passage. He talks about how, what the earth is, it, the earth is, is representing the radiant substance. Matter of fact, even the Garden of Eden is representing this this, um, let me see if I could find it in here. The Garden of Eden represents a region of being in which are provided all the primal ideas for the production of the beautiful. As described in Genesis, it represents allegorically the elemental life and intelligence placed at the disposal of man through which he is to evolve a soul and body. The Garden of Eden also represents allegorically the elemental forces named by sciences, the etheric. So the Garden of Eden is not a physical place, metaphysically. And so 
Out of the ground made Jehovah God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what do you guys think about this tree of knowledge of good and evil that we're not to consume? Adam and Eve were told not to consume of it. What do you think of that? The tree is a metaphor for the idea of consuming the fruit. Mm -hmm. The fruit is the knowledge. And the tree serves as a metaphor. Every tree bears its own fruit. And this particular knowledge is knowledge of things of God and things that are not of God. So the tree is more allegorical than, than a tree in, in reality. You're not going to find a tree that has that information. They're talking about the fruit. And the fruit being the, the knowledge or the understanding. So I can't go to the grocery store and buy this fruit? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's the tree of knowledge. The of tree God. of knowledge of understanding. And you're saying that that at, um, they were forbidden to eat the from the tree of knowledge of understanding? No, it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay. That's what the Bible says. We don't want to change it. The idea is, you know, and this, this goes for us today. It's no different than it was for Adam and Eve, although that's allegorical when they speak of Adam and Eve. As long as we keep ourselves stayed on the information and the knowledge that is in alignment with God, we don't have a lot of issues in life. But when we start taking information of the knowledge that is other than God, knowledge of things like envy, knowledge of things like hate, knowledge of things like anything that might be negative, and we enter that into, its, into our awareness, it is like, allowing someone to put mud in your in your water you know it, it, it's forever soil you have to clear it out and and what scripture is saying in a in a colorful picturesque way that you don't want to consume that information you want to stay with that of good report that which is a good measure that which is in any way uh noteworthy is what you want to keep in your awareness. You don't want to add all these other things into your awareness. So when they consume the fruit, which means take in the knowledge of things that are not of God, and you do have the choice to do that. You have a free will. The minute you do that, you start to fall. Now, does that mean that we kind of keep our head in the sand when there's things happening around us. No. And, and, and while Reverend was talking, this is what came to my mind. I work in a correctional setting with juvenile offenders that have done some things and they have done some terrible things. Some of them, I may walk around with a, a knowledge. I might walk around with an, a, a, hmm, what word I want to say knowing that they've done this, that, and the third. But I might not operate in the awareness of that. And what I mean by that is I tend to see them in a very pure way. Even though I know what they did, but I still say namaskar to them. So it's not that we're supposed to not realize certain things and like walk around, don't lock your car doors, don't lock your house doors. That's not what we're supposed to do. But the truth of the matter is symbolically Adam and Eve was put in this garden 
of perfection and said, you can eat any fruit you want, but don't eat of this, this tree of duality because on that day, you're going to surely die because you're going to experience a separation from good. It's a, it's a false sense of separation, but it's still, you begin to feel separate from God. You begin to feel a separation from the good that comes from God because you're looking and you're seeing lack because you're looking to the outer. Remember, we fix our eyes on that which is not seen because that which is unseen is eternal and that which is seen is temporal. And what I mean is you fix your eyes on what is of God, but Adam and Eve began to look more to what was happening outside of them. The only way you're going to understand what's, what's of God is to go within. You got to go within because you're temples of the living God and sit with God and pray with God. And then you will see God's beauty all around you. But Adam and Eve began to do less of talking with God. In fact, they hid from God after they ate of that tree because then they said, oh my God, I don't have any clothes on. I'm naked. I'm exposed. And then God said, well, who told you you were naked? What do you know about that? You're supposed to be pure beings with a single eye, only seeing good. So how could you know you're naked? How could you feel shame? How, what do you know about shame? Why would you, how could you feel that? And so the knowledge of good and evil means that you are looking to the outer to and it it could be some things going on out there and instead of trusting in God you're trusting in what your eyes are seeing and in all honesty David when he wrote these psalms he was being pursued by enemies but he said they won't touch me. A thousand will fall on one side and a multitude on the other. But it is not going to come near me because I dwell in the house of the Lord. And so it behooves us to, because we're talking about the law of vibration, the law of attraction and all of these things. And it relates to the scriptures. So if I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord, I'm dwelling in that beautiful vibration of God. And the law says that I'm going to attract things that is on that same vibration. So I'm going to attract love, prosperity, abundance, peace. It's going to draw to me because I'm in the same energy. And I may not know anything about anything else because I'm keeping my eyes single. So to eat of that tree of duality causes a sense of separation that led to us forgetting that we were children of the most high. We begin to forget that we were spiritual beings with a spiritual purpose. And so that's what's going on here. It says, the tr now here's Fillmore. That's an Andreaism. Let's see what Fillmore says. The tree of knowledge and good and evil represents the sympathetic nervous system whose fruit is sensation. When man controls his feelings and emotions, his sensations are harmonized and all his functions are supplied with nerve energy. But when man gives way to the pleasure sensation, he consumes or eats of that energy and robs his body of its essential nerve food. Thus, excessive sense pleasure and the pain that follows are designated with good and evil. So that's Fillmore and how he saw it. But I simply saw it as you are to consume 
that which is good. That's why I put you in this garden. Do not start because, you know, these are humans. And as they began to feel and touch and, and all of these things, they begin to rely more and more on their five senses and not the sixth sense of intuition, and not standing on faith. So let me um, try to close us up here. We only have a few minutes. And Jehovah God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And Jehovah commanded him saying of every tree of the garden you may eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So the garden symbolizes the omnipresent unseen realm out of which comes the visible universe. Martin Science has named it the cosmic ether. It cannot be described in human language because it transcends all the comparisons on earth. Jesus said that the mysteries of the kingdom are revealed to those who are spiritual awake, but to others must be told in parables. The human body with its psychical and spiritual attributes comprises a miniature garden of Eden. And when man develops spiritual insight and in thought, word and act voluntarily operates in accord with the divine law then rulership authority and dominion become his in both mind and body the kingdom of god is within you jehovah god the active representative of divine mind and man places man in the garden of eden to dress it and keep it man dresses and keeps the garden by developing in his consciousness the original pure ideas imparted by divine mind. As man established ideas of truth, he calls into manifestation his spiritual body image in substance by divine mind. And so this goes is now 827. I do not know. Oh, I might as well finish this up. So we do know the story of Adam and Eve. We know that a feeling nature represented by Eve partake, took of that fruit. And Adam allowed her to feed it to him. The subconscious mind was dominating the thinking nature. And that is not how it's supposed to be. You in your thinking capacity should be feeding things to the subconscious mind. But Eve representing that feminine subconscious mind was feeding Adam representing the thinking capacity. And there was a problem there. He partook something that he should not have. Eve really got a bad rap because if I wanted to be really literal about the whole thing, when God made the commandment not to eat of that tree, Eve wasn't even there. It was just Adam and he should have known better. I'm talking about in a literal sense. So it says that it was decided that man should not be alone. And so Eve was taken from a rib. Adam was put to sleep. It says here, as in Adam all die, fall asleep, lose spiritual consciousness. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. Awakening cannot be associated with dying. The idea that man awakens to spiritual or any kind of consciousness immediately after death, whether in heaven or hell, purgatory or elsewhere, is opposed to truth. His awakening must take place here during the time of life. But the truth of the matter is, 
Nowhere did they say Adam ever was awakened. He was put, <laughs> scripture said he was put in a deep sleep, but nowhere does it say he was awakened. The soul is here coming into the positive development of divine love, the woman. Love is the passive quality of mind and must become active through man's volition before it can be brought forth. And man must enter into a passive side of being and cease from outer mental activity. This state is symbolized by deep sleep, the outer consciousness of quiet, allowing the spirit to express itself fully. Man evolves, obtains consciousness in mind and body, and he becomes aware of the divine ideas implanted in his being. In this chapter, Adam names calls to consciousness in life's activity, the beasts in the field and the birds in the heaven. Then in moments of meditation, when the outer mind is still, he makes contact with the subconscious, E. The Hebrew word from which rib is translated means curved surface not specifically one of Adam's ribs, rather a curve of beauty innate in Adam. The development of Eve is a refining process that helps man to bring forth his divine feminine nature. The rib or bone that became woman is symbolical of the very substantial character of love that she represents. Adam is the objective and Eve is the subjective, both in the same body. As man evolves, Eve becomes objective. This is how bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she called, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. If the ego or will that is man has altered to be guided be the guiding light of spiritual faithfully and has carried out in its work the plans that are ideated in wisdom. It has created a harmonious consciousness. The original Adam and Eden is symbolical of this harmonious consciousness. The deep sleep into which the intellect is plunged when true love is experienced still prevails in human relations. Love is the great mystery of life. The spiritually wise see love as a force that enfolds the mathematical precision of the galaxies in space, as well as the tiniest atom. Science names it gravity. And I actually agree with that with Fillmore. I think that gravity is the love of God holding us in place. But that is manifest man. And so we have gone through tonight manifest man and how this manifest man evolved into wisdom and love, Adam and Eve. And so we will continue as we talk about the fall of man, I believe, and then I'll bring in some stuff. I probably will play a little small slip snippet of this book so that you can be introduced to it. But the next chapter is the fall of man. And so we will talk about that. Remembering that we said last week that when we talk about the book of Genesis and the whole Bible, we're talking about the generation, the degeneration and the regeneration. In chapter, in the first book of Genesis and the second book of Genesis, we covered the generation, that perfect idea, that generation. When we go into the fall of man, we're going into the degeneration. And as you go through Genesis and Exodus and all of those other books, Judges, that is all a part of the degeneration. It is the fall of man from consciousness. And you'll see through the story of the Hebrew children how that they, they went deeper and deeper and deeper into that consciousness. 
and the regeneration comes with Jesus the Christ. Any comments? Always blaming the woman, but they shouldn't, Betty. They shouldn't. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you, Adam was, <laughs> Eve wasn't even on the scene when those instructions were given. And then on top of that, when you say that they put, um, what Adam was put to sleep, mm -hmm. you know, and then it was just Eve. And then the creation of man followed that. Well, okay, the so man was so created, but the way, well, and it's allegorical. So yeah. they're saying that this feminine side had to come out. So in order for the feminine side to come out, Adam had to go to sleep. He had to go like, okay. yeah, like in a meditative state. Okay. Yep. But it's just <laughs> odd that they never said he woke up. <laughs> right right that that that's confirms that just so 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 you know just some important key components that is missing that we just have to mm -hmm. put the two and two together along the way well some of some some of us is running around sleep to this day so. <laughs> reverend you got yeah. anything to say Not really. I'm just letting you guys go on and talk about us men. <laughs> I know I'm outnumbered, so I'm just. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you know, it is the um, emotional side, which people tend to say is the feminine side. We both have both both sides to us. That that intellectual side or that that reasoning side, and the emotional side. So. What happened is the side that really governs and is supposed to have leadership of our individual psyches went to sleep. Yes. And the part that is the emotional side of us, if you want to call it feminine, you can call it feminine, but the side that is feeling went to sleep. So the, the uh, adversary, being, being it the snake, being it your ego, being it whatever you want to call it, can appeal to that side of you that is emotional. If I want you to do something wrong and I want you to do something bad, I am not going to appeal to you logically. I'm going to appeal to you mo emotionally, either one through fear or through your reactions. I'm going to appeal to something negative e or your ego in order you to get you to do something that you might not normally do or that might be what you would consider wrong. Anytime you've done something wrong, the appeal was usually an appeal that was of your ego and not of your higher self. So when the uh, intellectual side well, is, is actually not available, you're going to be more likely to do something out of emotion. That's not to say that women are more subjective no. to doing something wrong because most really vile crimes are committed by men, but they are, they give in to the emotional or the egoic side of themselves. You know, people paint that on Eve, but we all have that side to us. Or if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing half the things that we do, male and female. So, you know, just to paint it that way, as the woman is weak, this, that, that's not really what the, the, is being expressed here. It is the emotional, egoic side of yourself that's making these decisions, which are far removed from the side of yourself that would be uh, more grounded in the intellect. Neither one of them were com completely spiritual because both of them ate of the apple or the fruit. So, you know, they both did it. So, but the, the one was more subjective to it because uh, the the, uh, the 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 devil or the snake or whatever you want to call it, I think of it as the ego. Actually, got her. Well, to Fillmore want to would his, say it's our God. sense nature. It is our sense nature, which is grounded in your ego, and that's what we're talking about here. The, the snake is a metaphor for our egos. 
So, you know, so she, the, the feeling nature, it, and you're right, Reverend, when we get in trouble, we're usually being uh, led by the feeling nature. And so it's not about Adam and Eve as a woman and male when you're talking about metaphysically. It's really about your thinking nature falling asleep, never waking back up, and you letting yourself be dominated by your emotions. So, so with that, we're going to close up. I've kept you 10 minutes late. These... um. The, Genesis, the book of Genesis and going into metaphysics, you got to take in slow walking a little bit. I appreciate you guys staying with me these 10 minutes over. And I just say that the light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. And the very presence of God is watching over us. Wherever I am, God is and all is well. And so it is. See you so guys is. later. Blessings. Enjoyed it. Thank Blessings. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Bye. Uh, much clarity tonight. Thank you because um, I'm glad you made mention of the um, the fact that you know when you a lot of times you think in the literal or oh yeah, but man and woman, and it's more to it than just that part.